poorly. Perfect. So we're ready to jump straight into the sculpting process. But one of the things that I want to mention, and this is, I would say, imperative for a good artist, it's reference. We we all, like, if I go and tell you, without seeing any reference, to draw a Plague Mask Doctor, everyone's going to be able to draw something that looks like it. But it's going to be very difficult for you to nail all of the, like, uh, single details or the, the important parts or proportions of the element. So that's why it's very important to be humble as an artist and make sure that you always look for reference because reference is what's going to guide us to make sure that we can create something that's going to look cool in a game as a cosplay or whatever anything right so i really like this sort of effect where the eyes are kind of like poking out there's others where the eyes are a little bit more like flush to the element we're going to be playing with some elements and some shapes but in general you can see that the plague doctor's mask was used of course to keep the odors out and uh, i read somewhere correct me if i'm wrong chat i read somewhere that uh, doctors used to place some like herfs on the beak of the of the mask so that they wouldn't smell it as badly right uh well i was doing some research yesterday about plague doctors and something that really jumped to me was that this hook that they have this like hook baton i thought it was just to look cool but no it's um it's actually to uh to poke the dead bodies and remove the clothing without having to touch them so it served the purpose and, uh, and that's a very i think it's a very interesting thing who is this character, by the way? I have saw it in a Mongols game. Oh no, this is not a character, man. This is a is something that happened back in like medieval times or like uh, the Renaissance. I'm not sure. Um, it, they're called the Plague Doctors, and they were literally doctors that were fighting the plague. So this was kind of like the outfit that they used to to remove themselves from the from the virus, right? So it's a very famous or like cultural character because it looks very creepy, right? So yeah, this is the one. So here inside of Seabrush, I um I got a a head that we're gonna be using as our sort of like a mannequin head for the reference of our character, and it's gonna be uh, this one right here. The textures are a little bit off, but again, I'm not gonna worry about the textures. This is not a head that I sculpted. I could have sculpted a head, of course, but this is not the one that I sculpted. And again, later on, you're gonna know why. I'm doing this that I'm doing. So let's go here to texture map. This one comes with a texture. I'm just going to turn it off. And the, why is it black? That's really weird. Let's go sub tool and there we go. Turn on the poly paint. So yeah, this is the head. This is the, the one that we're going to be using as our, as our reference for the size of the mask and everything. Um, more gaming says there is a scary urban legend story of plague doctors also. Yeah, history, internet, they're very famous. Like I've seen them in like what Assassin's Creed and the uh, World of Warcraft has some like uh, skins related to it. So it's kind of like like a cultural thing. So let's go before COVID. That was cool. Yeah, yeah, that's right, man. Let's go over here and append a sphere. There we go. And the first thing we or the first thing I like to do whenever I'm starting a project is the block out. Uh, I've been criticized before, not by um, by anyone whose opinion is really worth it, <laughs> but I've been criticized before about like the, the blocking phase. Some people say like, that's ah, not really useful. You don't really need it. I say it's really, really useful because if you have a good blocking, then making sure that you can move on to the next stage is really, really good. And it's very easy to do a blocking. Like it only takes you a couple of minutes to generate something that looks close to, to what you're looking for. And that's it. You're gonna use your BAMP strat head? No, 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 I don't think I'm gonna use that one uh, this time. Let's grab this one. This one is a very kind of like traditional sort of like plague mask doctor. So I'm gonna copy this image. Let's go pure ref. And this is another thing that's very important. Again, we as artists, we tend to be very impulsive, I think. I'm not sure if it's a, it's a characteristic for anyone. You let me know in the chat if you guys are the same, but we tend to just like want to do the thing, right? So, so we're like, oh, I'm gonna do a plague doctor mask. I'm just gonna jump straight into Seabrush and start sculpting. But we we don't see the thing. <laughs> we we don't take enough time to to really appreciate or, or study how the proportions and everything should be looking. Now, I don't want to make it super exaggerated. As you can see here, it is pointy, but it's not that pointy. So it's probably gonna be like right around there. As you can see, it goes. To beneath the chin roughly because everything else is kind of like covered by a like a ski mask and um and then we got like the the bridge of the nose and it covers above the eyes goes back here as well i'm gonna use trim dynamic here to start like flattening things of course i don't have my ui here let me see if, if i can grab it my UI, by the way, if you guys want to use it, it's on the resources folder of our um, of our Discord channel. So if you go there, there should be my, my UI. 
it's free to download. It's nothing special, but it, I mean, it's uh, it's helpful if you know. If there's a lot of tools that you're going to be using quite frequently, it's quite helpful. Assets, there we go. There we go. And I like the blue color. I've always liked this sort of like electric blue element. So yeah, this looks like a crow. It's it's it's. I think it's supposed or meant to represent the crow, which of course is the like the the scary animal that goes to the dead bodies, right? So let's start doing some flattening here. Let's go a little bit over the elements. And right now I'm focusing on the sort of like leather like part of the mask. I'm I'm not worrying about the um. What's the word about the eyes or the buttons or anything like that? It's just like thinking about the patterns that we're going to have here. Let's turn on Dynamesh. Oh, that's way too low. That's a little bit better. But let's go to like 600. There we go. Now, this is a great stage because if you nail a good blocking, you can actually make the life easier for a lot of people on the pipeline. For instance, if I have a good like blocking on the on the element, I could literally set this, uh, like not sell. <laughs> I could send this to the um, to the render artist, and they could start doing some render tests to see what kind of angle of light they're gonna look the best. I could send this to the rigging artist so they can take it into account for the for the rigging process. So so there's a lot of things that we can do to to make this thing look good. Gassi, what's up, my friend? Welcome to the chat. Now, as always, my friends, if you have questions, this is the moment to do it. I know I, I upload content to, content to YouTube and you can ask questions there as well, but now we're live. So if you have questions about workflows, the industry, um, techniques, whatever, again, this is the this is the moment to do it. This is the moment to ask. What I'm doing here is I'm adding a little bit of volume to the Psygomatic arc just to, to represent and give a, a stronger feel. Now, I'm not going to copy this mask exactly. I'm going to like take some artistic liberties, of course. But we need to keep the function of the element uh, present. Do you guys, let me know in the chat, who knows what the Bauhaus is? This is something that I mentioned frequently, but I feel like it's a, it's a bit of information that a lot of people don't know about. So if you're new to the channel, you might have not heard about this one before. It has to do with art history. It's called the Bauhaus. Do you guys know what that is? Dr. Plague is a good choice for... Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool, like, element. And we're going to make this a little bit more exaggerated. Something with function. Yes, Andy, that's right. Something with function. But do you know where the term's coming from? More Gaming says, I got a question. Will you do a Christmas special series called, like, doing... Yeah, we're going to have a Christmas special. The... The... On the... Um... We're probably going to have two streams that week. Uh, the week of the 22. So, on the 22, we got our last portfolio review of the year. That's when we're going to have our Christmas special. And I got a, a little surprise for you guys over there or at that point. But there's probably going to be either a special week on YouTube or a special like event on YouTube where I sculpt like Christmas theme elements. And um, and we'll see what else we can come up with. Bauhaus is a shop for your house. No. <laughs> Hudson says, never heard of it. Well, today you guys are going to learn something if you've never heard. The Bauhaus was a German design school from the 1930s and 1940s that got very famous for for changing the rules. You know how in the art world there's always like revolutions in regards to to what is art and what's not art. I know at like contemporary art like modern art what the hell is that? <laughs> Give me one second guys. We got a freaking freaking ad. Oh, there we go. Okay, this one shouldn't have an F. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the Bauhaus was this like design school from uh, from Germany, and they like created a new style of approach for construction, for furniture design, for painting, for a lot of things. And one of their main points is a sort of like quote that says, "Form follows function." So what they were really worried about is making sure that whatever you were making worked, right? Like it makes no sense to have a chair that you cannot sit on. It doesn't make sense to have a door that you cannot open. It doesn't make sense to have a building that you cannot inhabit. So their design was like very, very functional. You can look it up in Google Bauhaus and um, and they got some very famous chairs over there and famous like furnitures and things like that. But I've always found that very interesting and, and I'm sort of like, I, I follow that sort of effect where where I, I, I want to um, 
I always want to make sure that whatever I'm making makes sense. I'm not just gonna. I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna add cool things just for the sake of adding cool things. Okay. Let's turn on transparency here, and I just want to make sure that we have enough room there for the for the nose. That's why this mannequin is so important because it allows me to to make sure that uh, like again things make sense. So this is a good shape. I, I like how this is looking. I might press that a little bit more right there. This beak does look a little bit bigger, though. I'm going to exaggerate the size just a tad bit right there. And now if we if we go again to the reference, uh, there was a reference that I was looking at yesterday that I really liked. It was like this, where the front part of the beak was like made out of metal, kind of like reinforced. And then there were like this sort of uh, leather, like this one right here. This one's very, very cool. So I'm going to copy it. And I want to do a little bit of that. So instead of having a single sort of like a single layer with the, with the seam lines, seam lines are very easy to do. I kind of want to have multiple leather patches making up the, the mask. So I'm going to show you here a technique that's very, very ha like handy here inside of uh, ZBrush to generate multiple meshes very quickly. So one thing is we can mask things out. So I'm going to mask this out right here. We know that the eyes are going to be like right around there. Again, if we do a transparency, actually, they're going to be closer to like that section right there. And then we can go in here. Push forward a little bit. And that's it. By the way, a lot of these techniques I cover on the on the ZBrush course that we did a couple months ago. I'll share some updates about the new course soon as well. Let's see. Um, any tips on how to stay consistent or what is the best way to learn? Thanks in advance. Oh, dude, you're, t you're touching a, <laughs> a very sensitive point for me right now because this past couple of weeks have been really, really tough on my like mental mental state. Um, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no psychologist. Like I, I, I won't be able to give you like the best advice, but just trying to do something simple every day, just like one step every day helps because once you do that step, it kind of like keeps rolling. So for instance, for me, when I'm feeling really like down and I need to, to do or record some elements, I say, okay, I'm just going to record five minutes and I record those five minutes. And after you've recorded those five minutes, it's a little bit easier to just say, okay, let's just keep going. Like it's looking good or it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm um, what's the word? I'm feeling okay. Let's uh, just do five more minutes and then you do five more minutes and five more minutes. And that way you just keep moving on and that's it. So I'm going to extract this thing right here at zero thickness. This is very important. Zero thickness. And as you can see, what's going to happen is we're going to get this. It looks very, very ugly. See how the borders are all like messed up. Well, there's a very cool thing that we can do here. Uh, it's under the deformation panel and it's called the polish the polish option if i just polish this you can see that all of the polygons get well polished kind of get a, a, a smaller nicer effect but before doing that i am going to do a c remesher so i'm going to go geometry c remesh and just c remesh i don't really care about the poly count it might be a little bit too high right now so i'm going to hit seed half and say c remesh again and every time i hit c remesh as you can see we're going to get less and less polygons there we go so something like this is way way more workable than what we had before and now we can go to the deformation tab do a little bit of polish and look at that crisp as fuck <laughs> that's really really crisp right so you can see like that's the sort of stuff that you would probably do inside of blender or inside of maya to really clean your um your object and now that we have this, we can go to geometry, dynamic subdivision, turn on dynamic subdivision, and add a little bit of thickness. Okay, and you can see that we get the thickness, and that's going to give us a very good idea of how the whole thing is going to is going to work. At this point, remember this is uh, the dynamic subdivision is kind of like using a subdivision modifier, so this is not permanent. So I can start like moving things around, and it's not going to affect the the the, um, the high poly. So I'm just going to. Give myself a a little bit of a, a little bit more room in certain areas that's a great great trick to to clean topology aki says can't wait for a course for 3d printing there are very few or i didn't find any good one what would you like to see on one i because i've been thinking about doing one like a 3d printing course but i really don't know what difference it would make because 3d printing is really easy like like the settings and the supports and that it's relatively easy um, the, the difficult part is the sculpting part, right? So, so what kind of sculpting would you look, would you be looking for? Or what kind of like, yeah, like concepts or something. Let's turn on dynamics of the vision for just a second. I'm going to 
try to make this a little bit pointier. Right there. Same here on the bottom side. And I actually want to extrude some of the elements right here. So I'm going to go to C modeler. I got my C modeler over here. And uh, first I'm going to poly group, I think. So I'm going to go to poly here. Let's poly group. To poly group. That one, that one, that one, that one. There we go. And then I'm going to go to edge. I'm going to say extrude. Extrude move. And I'm going to do the... Mm -mm, let's try poly loop. No, that's doing the whole thing. Uh, I'm trying to see which one will work the best. Yeah, I guess this works. I just wanna kind of like it's just a move. I'm gonna move this a little bit there. go and then we're gonna go to bridge gonna bridge from here to here now i'm just gonna go to my move brush and give this a a little bit of a of a rounder effect just play with the shape a little bit and, and that's why it was very important to to generate a low poly mesh of this thing because trying to keep this as a high poly is going to be very very difficult Let's go back to C modeler. Very important to have a, a uniform like distribution of polys. So I'm just gonna add like a couple of polys there. And you can see now when we do dynamic subdivision, look at that. We're gonna get this very, very nice like uh like framing on the top, right? To to attach eventually the, the strap on the back. A model, really, really detailed model, maybe a creature with all the important notes, like how to do keys and cuts. Yeah, you know what? Like a creature course might be good. Like that that sounds fun. Like do a creature course and then and then 3D print it. Okay, so let's go again to my move brush. I'm gonna turn this off, and I want to create a, a more of a of a circular vibe here on the front. So I'm gonna start kind of like pushing these corners. You can smooth them out a little bit, of course. You can turn this on, but as you can see, it becomes a little bit wobbly. And I want to try to keep them as round as possible. Now, here's a good moment where we could append some uh, cylinders as well. So I'm going to go append. We're going to do a cylinder. Let's make it smaller. And uh, position it where it's supposed to be. It's kind of like a 45 degree angle. It's kind of like a window. It's not really eyes looking forward. It's more like a window for the eyes, right? So right around there. Probably a little bit less like incline. There we go. Not too well. I kind of like those high eyes right there. What do you think? Should we do like the eyes quite high or should we try to keep them a little bit more flush with the surface? It's very hard to see. I've never worn one. There we go. So now, of course, we uh, do a mirror. The x-axis. And then we can go back to this one. And now that we have the, the eyes as a, as a sort of reference, it's going to be a little bit easier to, to make sure that this sort of like leather element holds the, the circumference of the eyes, you know, a little bit better. Now, I'm one of those artists that like to make mistakes <laughs> and don't don't take me the, the wrong way it's not that i like to to mess things up but i remember when when i was in school one of the things that a teacher uh gave me a very very harsh feedback on was that in order for to make things look realistic we need to make them not perfect and um in cg uh cbrush maya blender all of the softwares they tend to make things very very perfect like it's part of like their the way they work right because they're mathematically like programmed to do so so if you have slight like overlaps here and there if you have slight gaps like this one right here 
it actually helps like it actually makes your your element look a little bit nicer or i would say a little bit more realistic because you're not worrying about um what's the word it's not that you're not worrying like you are making sure that the thing that matters most is the fact that it looks cool rather than it looks like super perfect i would like a bit more flat eyes says um andy let's make them just a tad bit flatter so I, I do want to have a little bit of silhouette poking out. But not, not like exaggerated as this one's right here. Your vision will turn into horse vision with this mask. Yeah, definitely, right? Let's do a quick save before anything happens. There we go. And now let's do the, the metal beak. So for the metal beak, I'm going to follow a, a very similar approach. So I'm going to just go to the side. Let's just mask lasso. And we're going to mask the lasso right here. As you can see... The, the one of the problems with masking is that masking is very dependent on resolution. So if you want to have a very clean mask, you're gonna have a you're gonna need a higher resolution. So this one's gonna go kind of want to create like a like an interesting pattern. So it's gonna go back, down, and then forward. There we go. That looks very nice. And this one's gonna be I'm not sure if it should be a little bit bigger than the than the other leather strap or a little bit smaller. I think a little bit smaller. And the leather strap, similar to what we have on this mask, it should like attach to the to the top of the beak. I think that that's a good plan. So we're gonna again extract at zero. The reason why I like to extract at zero is because I, I'm gonna have way more control over the whole thing this way. Let's go geometry. See remesher. Where is it? There we go. And we're gonna see remesh. And then we're gonna do half and see remesh again and again. And again, how much should you see remesh? Just until you get something that looks like nice, like this one right here. And at this point, the the, the form or the, the polish should work fine. We can try polish by features as well, which is a little bit less aggressive. I like that one a little bit more. And now the cool thing about this is that we actually have some edge loops that we can use. So if we go to geometry and we go to, again, dynamics of diff, turn this on and give some thickness to it. There we go. I think that's a that's a good amount of thickness. We can go back to, to this asset right here. And with move brush, I'm just going to move it a little bit over the whole thing. This thing right here, my friends, pay close attention to this. And uh, I'm actually going to gonna do I'm, I'm going to do like a like a short about this because it's, it's very, very important. One of the best ways in which you can generate a very like interesting looking asset is by adding a little bit of overlap and complexity on the elements. So a lot of people might be like, ah, I'm just going to leave this here because it looks like a clean cut. Yeah. But again, having this complexity just makes it a little bit more interesting. It's, it's kind of like layering in texturing or layering in animation. So layers are like the key to generating a cool thing inside of the of the 3D world. So just that little layer right there, that automatically, I think, makes it look a little bit more interesting. So let's go to this one right here. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to start like doing a little bit of hard surface because this one definitely needs to be way more hard surfacey. So before we do or we apply this dynamics of the vision, I am going to go to C modeler. And there is a line, as you can see, that runs very, very close to the center of the element. So I'm going to add an insert edge loop. Turn this off like right around that line, which is that one and that one. So now when we do dynamic self diff, what should be happening here is we're going to have a, a strong line right there. It still needs, you know, a little bit of work on the on the like hard surfacey thing that we're going to be doing, but it at least gives us a, a sort of like edge that we're going to be following. So I'm going to hit apply. OK, and this is very important because now that we've applied, this is a mesh, a complete mesh, both on the inside and on the outside. And uh, we need to be very careful in how we approach the following part. So I'm going to divide this a couple of times probably like two times and I'm going to use my trim dynamic which you guys know is one of my favorite brushes to give this sort of like a like hand hammered effect especially here on the tip I want to make it a little bit pointier now points in video games like very very sharp points are very very tricky to do it's one of those things that um that you can struggle sometimes to to generate on your on your asset. That's why a lot of games like World of Warcraft, it's it's very weird to or not very weird. It's very like, it's not very common that you're gonna see like super like needle sharp effects. So there's always gonna be a little bit of a bevel, a little bit of a chamfer or something. 
because when you bake, especially when you bake, it's very difficult to do that. Oh, your internet is messing up? I, I, I don't think we're having an issue over here, so... So yeah, it's it's probably your side, man. Don't worry. Remember that all of the all of the stuff is gonna be up in in YouTube as well. Now, if you really really want like a super super sharp like a uh, support line right there, like if you want this to be like machined, right? Like if it was made by a by a laser cut, you're gonna have to do retopology. Like there's no way over that. And you can look any tutorial online about like sci-fi armor, like super amazing sci-fi armor. Everyone who wants like super clean armor, you need to do retopology. It's an it's an um kind of like a a sad well not sad, but it's one of those like things about the about the 3D world that you definitely need to take into account. There we go. Okay, we're going to add more details a little bit later, but right now I, I want to focus on, on other parts. Because one mistake, and this is another advice that I give you guys, one mistake that I see a lot of my students make when they are working on their portfolio pieces or, or their projects is that they'll focus too much on one specific part of the asset or of the, of the prop or the scenario or whatever they're doing, and they neglect other things. And then when they finally like generate something that's very, very cool, it's like, oh yeah, this is perfect, you, you nailed it they have no more energy to to continue doing the rest of the things. So imagine that I, I just kept working on this like beak for like two hours and it's like looking freaking amazing. At that point, I'm going to lay uh, like, I, I don't want to do anything else. Like I don't want to do the rest of the masks, right? So, so it's very, very important that you, you always try to move in the same level of detail with everything so that you don't suffer from that effect of uh, a feeling overwhelmed or, or whatever. Let's go to this guy now, and we're going to split. And I'm actually, I'm actually going to be using one of the new tools that we have here instead of Seerush 2024. Let me just do... Let me save this as a, as a file here. Let's call this mask. Like, there we go. So in the new versions of Seerush uh, 2024, the knife curve, which originally would cut all of the geometry out, there is an, an option now to press a space, and you can do this option called split to parts. And what this will do is you can actually cut one part of the of the mesh and it will generate two parts so now uh this guy's right here as you can see there are two different uh, meshes which is very very cool why because if i just do a little bit of smoothing on the border you're gonna see how this looks like it's made out of letter patterns see that all right you didn't know that trick because you were not watching my videos on YouTube. <laughs> but this is a, a new, like, very, very cool tool to generate, like, section lines. And you can see it looks like, like damaged leather. So, um, so yeah. Now, do not make the mistake of just control right-clicking and then generating more Dynamesh because what's going to happen is that you're going to lose the, the, the combination. If you want to, if you want to keep the combination, you need to go to your Dynamesh options, select this groups and then auto groups. That will give a single polygroup to every element or a different polygroup to every element. You can see right now they look very similar, but they're actually different polygroups. And now when we Dynamesh, they're not going to be combined. So that's a very, very cool way to, to, again, to generate cuts. And as you can see, just doing that already makes the mask look very, very creepy. Oh, that's a very creepy smile. Kind of looks like the Joker smile, right? I like it. Or what do you think? Should we do it like a smile or should we go down here to this area? I'm, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to, to decide, help me decide, guys. Should we go up here and get this sort of like creepy smile? It looks kind of wonky. Or should we try going down here? Let me show you how it would look going the other way. So the other way would be... Kind of like a curve, like a very clean curve down here. Which one do you like the best, guys? The creepy smile or this curve right here? Gassi says, keep it as a smile. Aki says, smile is looking really good. Okay, let's go back to smile. I'm going to have to redo it, but uh, it's easy. Don't worry. Okay, so we're going to use again our knife brush. Uh, that's a very ugly curve. There we go. Let's do other groups. A little bit of smoothing to open up the 
the letter pattern. And there we go. We got the, the creepy smile. Now, this bottom part, I want to split it in half. So I'm going to go to this one right here. And with my brush here, I'm just going to split it in half. Let's see if it worked. It did work, but sometimes, sometimes uh, the knife brush doesn't work symmetrically as nice as it should. So let me show you another another way in which we can do this. Um, I'm going to go here and I'm going to go to subtools and we're going to do a split. This is something that I see a lot of people are scared of, like splitting their meshes and having like a lot of subtools. I've had projects like Thyros a couple of years ago. I think he had like 87 subtools. I've seen projects with like 200, 300, 500 subtools. So don't worry about the number of subtools. It does get a little bit difficult to um, to manage, but it's not that bad. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break symmetry. I'm going to try to do a cut right down the middle. Actually, I'm going to go select rect. I'm going to try to select half of the element. There we go. And I'm going to polygroup. So control W is the shortcut. And then I'm going to do this mirror and weld. Or actually, I want to do a mirror and weld. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to delete this guy. So select that one. Delete hidden. Dynamesh. As you can see, we're going to get this guy right here. We're going to mirror and mirror and weld. And as you can see, we're going to have um, the, the center line right there. It's a little bit off center. So I'm going to I'm going to double you this and just like move it a little bit more to the center Again, mirror, mirror and weld. There we go. That should be a little bit closer. I'm going to do all the groups. I'm going to uh, do I have symmetry? Maybe it's it did get stuck together, which I don't love. Another thing we can do is just duplicate this one, to be honest. So I'm going to duplicate and then this one I'm going to mirror just mirror. There we go. And then on this one, I'm going to say merge down. Hit OK, and there we go. So now if we do other groups, since they're not combined, each of them or each half should be a, a different half. And we're still going to have uh, mirror symmetry. So with that, we, we create another sort of like section line right there on the bottom of our of our mask. Cool. That, that's, that's looking good. I like that one. Um, What else do we have? Any more questions so far? No, we're good. OK, so let's start working now on the details. I think we can start doing a little bit of detailing. And uh, since we're already here, I'm going to turn off Dynamesh and I'm going to give myself a couple of extra edge loops. And I'm going to use clay buildup to start adding, you know, the sort of like leather effect that we would expect. So usually seam lines, this is very, very interesting. Usually seam lines are where we stitch things together, right? And there's going to be tension points. You can see them on your shirt. Actually, you guys want to see a little bit of marbles? It's a lot easier for me to show this in the, in the marble software. Let's open this real quick. There we go. So if you have two pieces of clothing, okay, let's say that guy and that guy, I'm going to grab this one. I'm going to freeze it and you stitch them together. You're going to get what we know as a seam line, right? But as you can see, there's not much like wrinkles right here. And the reason why we don't have as many wrinkles is because the amount of fabric that we have on one side is the exact same amount of fabric that we have on the other side. A very easy way to change that and, and have a little bit more wrinkles is to make one of the sides bigger than the other. That way, when you do the connection, as you can see, we're going to start having the wrinkles right there because there's more fabric that needs to be connected to this long strip right here. Let me get the music lower. That one's becoming a little bit higher. So yeah, this is what we're doing. Like those wrinkles that we're getting there, that's the kind of wrinkle that we want to like capture on our um, on our element. Let me make them a little bit more intense so that you can see them. And there we go. So you can see that there's always going to be tension on the point where things are connecting. And that's the kind of tension that we're looking for on the uh, on the seabrush element over here. So I'm going to use also Damien standard kind of like push. And create now you don't want all of them to be in the same direction kind of want to make this thing look a little bit crazier 
And some of you might be wondering, what shouldn't be we be using like alphas or something? And yes, we can use alphas. There's there's nothing wrong with that. But to be honest, I've always found hand painted like sculpted elements to look nicer. They they look more original. I like using alphas for for high frequency details. There's actually a, a video on YouTube on uh, sculpting wrinkles, and I explained that sort of like principle where where you can do it um, on one side. As you can see right now, I don't have the other side. If we need to do it later, I can just mirror or we can do separately from a game asset perspective. You probably would do mirror UVs to um, what's the word to to save this. I'm going to turn on symmetry. Actually, no, uh, here's a, a very cool advice that I'm going to give you guys on center lines like this one's right here. You do not want to have symmetry because symmetry is more noticeable on the center line of the elements than it is on the outside. So this guy's right here. They could like perfectly be it can be perfectly symmetrical on this side and, and nothing's going to happen like no one's going to know this but on the center line is very very easy to know this when something is completely symmetrical so i strongly recommend that if you're sculpting things try to keep the center line like uh, asymmetrical especially like in faces and things like that definitely want to keep things a little bit more asymmetrical Hand painted stuff feels timeless. Yeah, yeah. We did the. Um, was it last week? Tarn? No, last week was the rook, right? So two weeks ago, two weeks ago we had the the hand painted texture class, and that one was very fun as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's up on YouTube, by the way, if you guys haven't seen it, and uh, the files are available at Gumroad for free. Is you want to follow there we go look at that so that starts to look a little bit more interesting kind of looks like a smile right like the teeth from a smile i'm of course going to soften a little bit of the of the clay uh, tubes brush let's jump onto this one and again here is where it doesn't really matter that we have a symmetry because they're too far apart so when you see it from the front you're not going to notice it as much let's add some of this Effects. We definitely need one more subdivision level. I'm using Control D. That's the shortcut to add a subdivision level and get me uh, a little bit higher. I'm also going to add some like big wrinkles, big leather wrinkles right here, because leather is very interesting. I I <laughs> I, I own a leather jacket. Um, it's not like a super fancy one or anything, but it, it's a uh, it's one of my favorite ones. But I've gotten really fat this last year, so I don't fit on it as much as I did last year. And uh, but one thing that I noticed is that there's like you never have like a completely smooth surface. There's always like little wrinkles and things like everywhere. So so that's what like a visual interest on the on the leather effect. I think it's something that we can start adding on this mask right here. Now with clay buildup, I'm both adding and removing volume to generate something again a little bit more more interesting and we're going to be adding some stitches as well don't worry about that i'll show you in just a second how to do our own sort of like like stitch brush there we go looking good so far right and it's a it's a relatively simple prop. I think I think this is a really good like prop to practice with. So if you guys are learning ZBrush and you want to do a little bit of practice, this like plague doctor mask, I think it's a good one. And I think it's a good one because you can go as simple or as complex as you want. And that's always a a good way to to learn. Nice, that looks good. Okay, let's talk about the stitching. So there's multiple ways in which we can do stitching. One of them, probably the simple one, is just starting inserting like uh, toruses or something on the on the element here and um, and getting them where they're supposed to be. But one of the things that I definitely want to do is I want to mark the spot where the toruses are going to be. So I'm going to start using just my clay build up to to add the little like hooks where we're going to have our stitching. 
you can definitely like if you want to go like the full <laughs> if you want to go full overboard with this you can definitely make it make the inside of the mask as well in this particular case for this particular character that i have in mind we're not going to need to do the the inside of the mask because uh, it's going to be covered by the cloth and everything else but yeah you can you can go as crazy or as as, as simple as you want go on this side now, as you can see, a Taurus is not really going to work with this guys right here. Let's give it another subdivision. Okay, here I definitely want to turn on. Um, I'm going to give it another subdivision. And we're going to turn on symmetry. Because I do want the, the little loops here to be aligned. Very important, I'm not changing the size of my brush. Because if I change the size of my brush, then the size of these little loops are going to break. And all of this, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a game artist, so or most of the work that I do is for games. I've done other stuff as well, but uh, most of the stuff is games. So I care more about the bake, right? Like I, I, I know that all of this is going to be baked down into an element. It's going to be baked down into a low poly. So that's why I, I don't really like go through the object and make the, the inside of the mask because this is a mask that's only going to be seen from the, from the front. So let's go to our elements. So I'm going to go, um, I don't want to make them like round. Well, I mean, brown might look good, but I want to make them a little bit crazier. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to select a ring 3D. And I'm going to make a poly mesh 3D. That's the first thing I'm going to do. You can see that this is the front. That's fine. I'm going to rotate it so that it's uh, facing up and down. And then I'm going to delete half of it. Because we, we don't want to have extra polygons where we don't need them. So delete hidden. Then I'm going to scale it down. Because I want I want it to be a little bit flatter on the, on the ZX. I don't want it to be pushing too much up. But then I'm going to use inflate. Inflate brush. And we're going to inflate the the loop right here. There we go. And one of the things that I want to do is I want to have multiple of this guys. So I'm going to duplicate this two times. This one, I'm going to call the, the clean one. So it's going to be just like that. I'm, I'm not going to like modify it or, or change too much. This one, which is the, the second one, I kind of want to add a, a couple of wrinkles, like tension lines. So I'm going to make this asymmetrical. And I just like do a little bit of uh, like a twist, kind of like if it's twisting on itself. You know how you sometimes tie your shoes and and they don't look as flat and as pretty. Kind of like kind of like this. I might give it a, a a subdivision. Just keep in mind uh, what I'm about to do is we're going to be using an insert uh, brush. But the problem with that is that the polygon is going to be going really, really, really high. So just keep that in mind. Let's subdivide this one as well. I mean, if we're subdividing, might as well subdivide all of them. Again, just add a little bit of uh, of detail to the surface. But it doesn't look like just a round, super clean. Remember what we were talking about earlier today? About things looking perfect. And then this one, I'm going to kind of like break it a little bit. So, so it broke a little bit right here. Sarn has a question, says, from your experience, which industry values artists more, gaming or BFX? Gaming, uh, by far. <laughs> by far. Gaming, gaming, like, it's it's kind of like a, it's a difficult question, but uh, I would say artists get more recognition in the gaming industry than they do on the film industry, because in the film industry, the people who get the recognition are the directors, the actors, and sometimes, like, the, the screenwriters or the scriptwriters, cinematography. And you can just look at it, just look at the Oscars, right? Like, how many prizes are there for, for the actors? Like, two or three, right? Like, the best supporting actor, best uh, supporting actress, and stuff like that. How many are there for BFX? Just one. And it's not for, like, a particular artist, it's for the whole house. And sometimes it's like the main house because there's multiple houses that work on the movie so unfortunately artists do get the <laughs> the short end of the stick on the on the bfx industry and in and the media games there's a little bit more recognition um however i would say uh, uh no actually both industries are like <laughs> overworked for artists i was gonna say that they they work artists more on the on the gaming industry but it's it's pretty similar <laughs> um Aki says, uh, hey, just a quick question. You use alt-click, release, alt-drag background for zoom and zoom out on Is there any way to turn this option off? 
Actually, I'm not sure. I've, I've never, like, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think so. A lot of softwares use that sort of, like, approach to it. So I'm, I'm not sure, Aki. Yeah, that's it's it's quite insane and sad, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but you can see, for instance, um, yesterday was the Game Awards, right? And uh, there were a lot of prizes as well. And and you can see that there's more care for the different parts of the of the production, like voice acting, art direction, gameplay innovation, things like that. Um, that that makes it you know a little bit less uh, depressing. <laughs> Let's call this Stitch. We're gonna call this Stitch A. A, this one we're gonna rename and we're gonna call this Stitch B. And we're gonna rename this one and this one's gonna be called Stitch Z. There we go. So now I'm just gonna press B and I'm gonna make this an insert multi mesh brush. And as you can see, we got all of our three stitches right here. I'm gonna go to the brushes. Actually, I'm gonna save this brush. And if you guys want, I'll share it. Let's go. It's a very simple brush. I mean, it's nothing, nothing crazy. Let's call this mask stitch. There you go. We got uh, who's the follower now? Kagi Shin Second Art. Welcome, my friend. Thanks for the follow. How far are we from our from our goal? Like two or three? Let's go back here. And now I'm going to add a placeholder sphere. I'm going to go to a panth. We're going to panth a sphere. And uh, this sphere we're going to scale down. Oh. We're going to scale down. It can live there inside where we can like delete it later. It's just again as a, as a placeholder. And now we can start placing our stitches. There are ways to, to kind of like avoid hand placing things, but again, I'm one of those old school guys would like to, to get this thing looking cool. For instance, we can do a cross stitch right here. And the cool thing is, since we built this from a, a torus or half a torus, it should be fairly easy to to get this to do exactly what we want. And it's still an object, so at any point, you can just like push it, pull it a little bit, just get it where it's supposed to be going. Go back to this one, Let's grab Stitch B. And again, this is the this is the reason why art can be expensive sometimes. Because to do things like this, you definitely need to spend a little bit of time. But look at how nice the result is going to be, right? That's why games take long, long, long to be made. You guys saw the, the new trailer for, um, for Grand Theft Auto? I'm not a huge fan of Grand Theft Auto, to be honest. But I know that it's a, it's a big, like, uh, culture, cultural game, so... So I understand the, I understand the appeal. Go. Should be. We we don't have it on the other side, but that's a that's an easy fix. There we go. Yeah, the mask is looking quite nice, and uh, and we're barely starting. Uh, one thing that I decided to do with with the live streams now, because I was feeling a little bit pressure with uh, some of the old live streams where I needed to finish things in in like two hours. It's like, I'm just going to have fun. If I don't finish in two hours, that's fine. We can finish it later on with other videos and other live streams. Because I, I don't want to perpetrate the idea that um, you should be working fast, like all the time. I feel like uh, that's a disease that we have on the on the working world right now. Here in Mexico, it's, it's a horrible like working situation, to be honest. Because everyone expects everything to be done like super, super fast and super, super cheap. So we're used to rushing things and just like working stupid amounts of hours, stupid amount of stupid hours amounts. It's just, it's just not, not, not ideal. For instance, that one, I'm just going to like duplicate with alt and uh, control, control alt, and then just drag. 
do another one here. I'm going to do two kind of like long loops right here. And then this one, I can even leave it like I could even have like, like, I don't know, like two loops, like, let's say like an X followed by a V sort of loop. As long as it looks cool, we're fine. It's a real world now. People want things fast. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's sad. And I was uh, actually David. You showed me that video yesterday, right? There's this guy who worked at Blizzard. I don't remember the name, but he was mentioning that he had this sort of like PTSD of of working at Blizzard <clears throat> and then going to work somewhere else. And he was feeling like shit because uh, he felt like he was not working like fast enough. But one of the supervisors told him like, "Hey, no, you you're working like this is the right working pace." You were overworked, and uh, that's not cool. So yeah, unfortunately, there's there's a lot of that. I, I've I've had the fortune of working in multiple companies throughout my career. Some of them were like that, where you felt overworked all the time, because the the times were just like super super intense. And I've also worked at, at like companies where they paid me really well, like really really well. <laughs> like like <laughs> i'm gonna tell you guys i'm not gonna share exactly the product because i don't wanna i don't wanna like uh, uh reveal any sort of like industry secrets or anything but it was a project where i was hired and i probably worked like on my at my sort of like speed or the way that i normally work at like three or four hours per day for about two weeks and they paid me nicely like thanks to that i was able to do some remodeling on my house so so yeah, there are some companies that do value artists' time. And it, to me, that company was really, really intense or really interesting because I remember like uh, working late with the first day and I was working like at 6, 7, 8 p.m. And I messaged the lead uh, very late, like at 8. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm still working on this. Um, what do you think? Should I move this or change this? Or and he was like, dude, why are you still working? It's 8 p.m. We, we left like three hours ago. Like, just go home. I'm not even going to answer to you right now. <laughs> he said that in a nice way, like just trying to tell me, like, it's fine. Like, we have time. You can do this tomorrow. There's no need to rush. And that to me kind of like changed the way I, I was thinking about work, because, yeah, as I mentioned, we we tend to overwork quite a bit and not enjoy life in, in other senses. Look at that. That looks good, right? Do You guys like it? I think I'm gonna add another sort of like Z line over here going up, but I'm really pumped by this one. <laughs> Hi, what are we learning today? Except wine tastes good. We are going over seabrush sculpting, my friend. There we go. It's a very, very nice stitching, if I, if I may say so myself. <laughs> that looks really, really cool. And imagine the bakes and the textures, a little bit of rust and, and grime and things like that. Oof, ah, that's going to look good. Let's go to this guy. And one of the things that we definitely need to do is we, we need to add kind of like a, like a reinforcement to the leather here on the, on the side. Now, we can do it manually, but it's going to look a little bit wonky. So, so this is one of those elements, again, where going the extra mile even if it takes a little bit longer, it's always the best option. So let me show you. What I mean by this is, first, I need to make sure that this is like a little bit closer to the chin line. There we go. Because I want the depth of the, of the mask to be very, very similar. And be very careful, like pushing and pulling some of the vertex right here. And uh, usually like shirts and clothing and things like that, they have this thing, I think it's called the hem in um um in the in, in english in in spanish we call it bastilla which is the the reinforcement you give something so that you don't have the loose like threads at the end right so we're gonna add that i'm gonna start by adding a little bit of train dynamic here to to strengthen those uh, areas and and flatten them a little bit there we go And then what we need to do is we need to generate a band, like a new a new mesh, very thin mesh, but a new mesh that's going to sit on top of this thing and kind of like reinforce the 
B element. Again, later in textures, we can add the little, little small, um, little, little small uh, elements. And they're saying, would you do low poly or baking the stitches? Baking, baking, definitely baking. I mean, yeah, baking. I mean, <laughs> I would do bake because the type of stuff that I do is a lot of BR, so we can't afford to have like such high poly count. However, if you really, really want to do and go the extra mile and you have the, the poly count to allow it, then retopologizing every like little stitch right there so that you get like the surface bump, it would it would look amazing. But it's just, it's just I think it's it's unnecessary to be honest. And I remember seeing like the Batman games where the where the Scarecrow uh, appears or the or the what's that the Riddle and he has like similar things and it's just baked. For cinematic though, like you would keep all the high poly count. I just remember the first video I saw you was the the no face mask. Oh, that was the first one you saw, dude. You caught me like late on my on my YouTube uh, life. <laughs> that was like that was not too long ago. I think that was like earlier this year okay so let's go now with mask pen we're gonna create the edge right here now on this one i do want to be as clean as possible to make sure that we get the the proper thickness and the proper angle and everything there we go let's mask this inside as well i'm actually gonna isolate because eventually i i do want to like this is again one of the questions like like what about the inside are we gonna do like the inside as well we're not but it might be a good idea to do a little bit more than what we think we need just in case the cloth later on has a little bit of an issue. I I remember, I'm not sure if I was told this or I kind of like just came up with the idea, but I, I've been teaching this idea as well on my classes, which is if you don't see it, you don't model it. So if you if I ask myself the question, is this character ever going to take the mask off? No. Then there's no need to do the inside of the mask. There's no need to even do the face of the character because you're never, ever, ever going to see his face ever, ever like Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> so uh, let's go extract and we're going to extract again. Thickness is zero. Hit accept. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful, really clean cut, as you can see right there. First thing we're going to do is remesh. So see remesher. Let's do a low poly count and zero mesh. And since it's a very clean mask, we should get a very clean, like low poly, as you can see right there. And uh, we're going to do half and zero mesh again and again. There we go. And then we're going to go again deformation and just a little bit of polish. Just a little bit. Uh, that's a little bit too much, but it works. Now we go again to geometry. Dynamic soft diff, turn it on, and we do thickness. And as you can see, that little band rate is going to be very thin, like that. Like, we don't want any more thickness. Maybe just a tad bit more. But we don't want to, like, make this thing overwhelmingly, overwhel overwhelmingly thick. So just something like that. And that's it. As you can see, that kind of, like, reinforces the, the mask. And it gives that support so that the edge looks a lot cleaner. And later on, there's going to be stitching over here, right? Not this kind of stitching. It's more like like a simple stitching, um, like cloth stitching. But that's it. Like nothing else we need to do that. And look at how nicer the profile now looks there on the mask. I might push the head just a little bit in. So I want to see the, the border a little bit nicer. But there we go. That's uh, That gives us a very, very nice effect. This is where panel loops and things like that can also work. There we go. Now let's go over here. Let's turn on symmetry. I do want to do the little holes symmetrically. So we're going to start right here. Another one right here. 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 Kind of like a shoelace, right?
And of course, we need to, to finish it. Now, since we have these things, we now know that there's going to be a little bit more tension on those areas. And those are the areas where, where we can push. And thanks to the fact that we already have those elements, the little dimple that we get, kind of like when we're doing teeth on, on characters, so the little dimple that we get is going to look a little bit nicer as well. Now, one thing that you're seeing here, and this is a mistake that I'm making, is that all of my wrinkles are looking the exact same length. So you want to make some of them a little bit longer and some of them a little bit shorter. That's also going to add some variation to the to the element. How about you go about re how would you go about retopologizing this? I'll show you. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing cool on time. I'll, I'll do a little bit of retopology at the end, just to, so that I, I want to show you how this, especially this part right here, looks after the after the bake. So so we'll do a little bit of retopology. We'll do it in Blender as well. So I know you guys have been asking for, for more Blender content lately. I was, um, my brother, I have three brothers. Well, two brothers and one sister. I'm the oldest. And uh, my youngest brother, he he's what, like 26? He's 26 or 25. He's 25. He went yesterday to the Lego store. And uh, he bought himself a really, really cool, like big Lego piece for Christmas for himself. And they give him, um, they gifted him like several small kits. I've never been a huge Lego fan, but he gave me one of those. It's, uh, let me show you. I was really surprised. It was, it was like my little Christmas gift. Galileo Galilei Lego. It's like a little Lego set, this one. I, I started uh, assembling it yesterday. That little dude. It's gonna be here. Like uh, as soon as I finish it, I'm gonna place it here on the on the studio. But um, I was I was doing this, and um, and then I I saw I remember I saw a couple of months ago a a Lego shader with geometry nodes for Blender. So I'm probably gonna be giving that a go in the next couple of weeks. But I, I feel I don't know. I feel weird about just recording the same thing that someone else already did. Kind of feels like uh, like stealing unless I have something else to add. So I'll see that one, and if there's anything I can add, I'll do my own. If not, I'll just show you the result. It's a very, very cool one. I, I don't remember who did it. Polyforge or someone like that on YouTube. There's the, the very cool Lego Lego shader effect. Okay, let's go to the to the eyes. We definitely need to, to improve the eyes a little bit. And I really like this sort of like clean effect that we have right here. And that's very, very easy to do. So we're going to be using C Modeler, of course. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to delete some edge loops. So I'm going to go here to let's let me move this here. There we go. So we're going to do a delete and we're going to delete some some edge loop completes. And the delete is just to give me a little bit more room to work, especially on the bevels that I'm about to do. So over here, we're going to bevel edge loop complete. There we go. And then over here, all of these elements, I'm going to go uh, Q mesh or actually inset polygroup island. And we're going to inset this right there. I'm going to press alt to change the polygroups. There we go. So right around there. And then we're going to Q mesh. Push Q mesh polygroup island as well. We're going to push this thing in. Eventually, we're going to add like a sphere right there. And, uh, and that's going to be our, our element. Now, of course, uh, we need to bevel a little bit more. So let's go bevel here. That way, there, there, and there. Now, I do kind of like the, the other one that we had right here. So this sort of like inset looks interesting. But instead of doing an inset, I'm actually going to grab this lower border that we have, and I'm going to make it a little bit thicker. So I'm going to go here to insert. We're going to insert the natural right there. I'm going to delete this one. I'm going to polygroup. Uh, let's go here and we can polygroup uh, the poly loop. There we go. And then we can Q mesh again. Polygroup island. We're going to push this out. There we go. Um, let me isolate this. Oh, we have a big problem right there. Uh oh, are they merged? No, they're not merged, right? Okay, if they're not merged, then I can probably polygroup. 
polygroup the island. Island. There we go. So I'm gonna. That hell. We go. Control W to give it a, a single polygroup, and then just a delete hidden. There we go. So that way we we save ourselves from that uh, problem. Now this one, of course, let's uh, center the pivot point. It's no longer aligned to the normal, so that's gonna gonna make it a little bit complicated. Actually, let's can we mirror this? Okay. Okay, that's gonna be a little bit easier. Let's turn on symmetry. Oh, but they're are they combined? Yeah, that sucks. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna mirror to the other side. There we go. So now it's aligned to the to the axis. I'm gonna push it, just do a little bit of rotation to try to get the, the circle to Hey, okay, what the hell? Oh wait. Mirror, and then let's remove symmetry. There we go. I'm just gonna try to align the circle to what we originally sculpted. So I, I do want to see a little bit of the border. I'm like poking out like that remember how we talked about uh, overlaps and stuff so and here hey thanks man who is this? Uh, Shinimo Kuba, thanks for the follow, man. Are we close to the goal? I can't see the goal. I think we're like three away from the goal. So if you're watching and you're not following, help us. Help us get to our goal. So here I am gonna distort things a little bit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just like move this thing up. And again, this road like distortion is gonna make it so that objects or the object looks a little bit more real. Like it was kind of like hammered in or or like uh, adapted to to the eyes, so it's not gonna look like perfect circles. And I feel like I've always felt like that's where like slight deformations really help objects look just a tad bit more realistic. Finally, let's go here with C Muller. Oh, it crashed. It crashed, my friends. It crashed, and uh, I don't know when was the last time that I saved. That's going to be a sad moment. Oh my god. Oh god. Well, that's part of the process, unfortunately. <laughs> Let's see where we were, where, where we are left. At this point, guys, after 13 years of doing this, it, it no longer angers me. It's, it's, it's just funny. It's just stupidly funny. Okay, so this is the last quick save that Seabrush did. It's not that bad. We lost the little thing right here and we lost the eye. <laughs> oh, you got a lot of 3D softwares. Yeah, fuck. That's fine. Let's just save this. First thing you do after uh, something crashes, just save, 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 immediately saved. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not that bad. So let's work on another piece. When that happens, I, I just don't like working on the same piece again. So let's work on this piece right here. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to... Um, Oh, not an exposed solo. I want to sharpen this thing a little bit more. So I'm going to Dynamesh. Let me load my UI again. Yeah, it sucks. It's it's part of the yeah, it's part of the of the process, unfortunately. That's why I tell you guys save every 15 minutes. You should be saving or quick save or something. I, I just forgot on this one. I get a little bit distracted when I'm uh, when I'm recording or or when I'm explaining things, there we go. So I'm gonna turn on polish and I'm gonna keep the resolution quite, quite high and I'm gonna Dynamesh. I do not want to freeze the subdivision. Definitely need to push this way higher. Dynamesh, no. Oh, way higher. That's really interesting. There we go, that's uh, a lot better. And the reason why I wanna do this is because I wanna access the knife curve brushes to give myself some like more interesting clean cuts on the, on the surface of the element, like that one right there. Uh, otherwise, trying to do it with trim dynamic, it, it definitely becomes or would become a little bit complicated. Now, I do want this beak to be a little bit more ornamented, like what we see right here. I kind of like this uh, effect right there. Kind of looked like nostrils for the for the element. So I'm gonna mask things out, invert the mask, 
and then I'm going to go to the masking option and I'm going to do an option called um, sharpen. So sharpen mask. It's weird. I thought we would have we'll have a little bit more resolution. Really can't go any higher. 4K. The reason why the resolution is not allowing me to work properly is because um, we're working real world scale and real world real real world scale. It's a tongue twister right there. Uh, works a little bit uh, different. So we're gonna have to try our best here. I'm gonna select oh, those elements, then push this in. Push this in a little bit more. Control W. And as you can see, when we polygroup, that gives us a, a cleaner, nicer effect. Then we can mask that again. Wear the mask. Push this up. Control W. And then Dynamesh. And that gives us a, a nice little detail right there. No, 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 it's not that the object is too small, it's that the object is too big. So there, there comes a point where you have a very, very big object, and or maybe it is too small, I'm not sure. But yeah, it, it has to do with, with the size of the of the elements. Now, uh, I do want to create this sort of like pattern right there, and the masking is usually the way to go. So I'm literally just going to start drawing the mask. This is something that I've seen people that are doing jewelry do a lot. Well, they draw the pattern. I'm going to show you a, a tool that we can use to... Generate an interesting effect. As, as these things become smaller, you lose some of these kind of like binds, right? Drawing. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Have a little bit of uh... an important thing is to always push the same shape so as you can see i'm going to that like pointy end at the end i noticed when i scale animal it gave me more or less yeah, yeah yeah the scale of the model is definitely important for the for the scale of the dynamish and maybe it is too small because i i brought this mannequin from from marbles designer actually the head and marbles works in the millimeters so maybe it made like a very very small head Yeah, that seems about right. So I'm going to uh, get this guy and uh, I'm going to go to deformation. Again, where is it? deformation and there's one that's called inflate. And it's kind of like an extrusion. So we're just going to inflate this a little bit. Something like that. Control W and Dynamesh. And now it's going to look like a sort of like a bass relief right there. It's going to look very, very nice as you can see. I like it. I kind of like to add some section lines as well. So I'm going to use my Damien standard. And I'm like cut. This is metal, so metal works in a in a slightly different way. But I do want to add some sharp lines where they maybe bent the metal and welded it together, right? That sort of effect right there. Yeah, looks nice, right? Very... I don't know. It's very nice. <laughs> so, how are we doing now? We still got time. Even after our horrible crash, we still got time. So, I'm going to use Trim Dynamic here. Just damage a couple of the corners on the metal. Let's give this one subdivision level. We're no longer in Dynamesh. And again, with the mean standard, we can just reinforce that line of the metal. 
This is not leather. It's just a kind of sort of like metal union. But again, those those are the sort of, sort of details that people will sometimes uh, look at. I want to push this one a little bit more. So again, the mean standard. And I know that eventually we're going to have this sort of like grime effect there as well. So, yeah. I definitely miss the the things here. So let's do this because I know that I'm not going to be finishing the mask in this live stream. I think next live stream might be a good idea to to finish it as well. So we're going to have this is probably the first time we're going to do like a two part live stream. Uh, I might work on it a little bit uh, off camera on my own time again, just to to have some fun. But I do want to finish this mask um, while you guys are here. So maybe next week, either we'll do two live streams or, or on the next Friday live stream, we'll continue working on this mask. So I, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to need them for the for the next premium course. And, um, and I need to finish it. Uh, but I, I, I want to focus on this part right here. I'm going to work on this 15 more minutes. So, yeah, just 15 more minutes and then we'll send everything to Blender so that I can do a quick retopology on how I would approach the retopology of this element or of this asset. And I'll show you a quick bake instead of substance to um, just to close the to close the chapter. OK, so let's go for the mask on this thing, because, oh, that that mask was looking nice and we lost it. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to confess something I did when I was at Nomen. I think I've shared this before somewhere else, but it's a it's a sin confession. I was working in lab two with my friends and the Nomen when you are well, at least when I was there, they had this thing called the lab time. So you had your normal classes with your teachers and everything. And then you had lab time with students from every single um, like term. So you might be on a, on a room with someone from term 10 and you were in term two. And it was very cool because if you were working on, let's say, your intro to Maya class, they would be working on their portfolio piece and you could ask them, right? So if, if, you're, if they were not um, like super busy, you could just ask them, hey, how would you do this? And of course, someone with more knowledge would give you a better insight. There were also lab techs who were other students. They were the, like the supervisors at that time. And they could help you with your homework as well. So the idea was for you to be doing your homework there and just network and uh, meet people. It was, uh, again, very very cool thing and in lab 2 however there was a problem where there was an island of computers four computers at the center of the room and they were all connected on the center <laughs> so one day we were working there and i accidentally kicked the regulator and turned everything off on the lab like every single project was off because i i pressed the wrong button with my foot i felt horrible but hopefully no one knew. <laughs> no one knew at that time that it was me. Uh, I lost my work as well. So I was also part of the victims, but I was the, the guilty one there. And I, uh, I unfortunately made some of my friends lose a lot of, well, not a lot of, it was like, like an hour of work at that point. Now, 10 years later, it's funny, but back then it was not funny. Let's go now with the geometry and uh, we're going to do a um, extraction again. Sorry, sub tool. Extract. Zero thickness, there we go. Accept. And zero mesh. Yeah, because we had sometimes, uh, like sometimes, uh, like lights went out and you would lose your whole work and it was no one's fault. But that time, it was my fault. I admit it. Ten years later, I accidentally kicked the regulator. Let's go now with the uh, dynamics of division, turn this on, and we're going to add a little bit of thickness. Again, we don't want too much thickness. It's just so that we get a little bit of, uh, of a detail and a border there on our, on our mask. There we go. Oh, like, a, like a reinforcement. Push this more to the, towards the back. We 
we're getting to the end of the year. How, how have you guys felt this year? Do you guys feel like you learned a lot as, a, as an artist, as 3D artist? Did you improve? This is always a good time to kind of like go over your experience, I would say. I, I always use December as a sort of like an evaluation time for myself. Like I see all of the things that I did in the past 12 months, the goals that I achieved, the ones that I didn't, what things can I improve for next year, things like that. Of course, party. You guys, yeah, this one, this year went very, very quick. Do you guys celebrate Christmas? Here in Mexico, it's uh, quite a big thing, I would say. Quick save. Best year of year now. There you go. This was, for me, it was a really fucking weird year. Like, a lot of things that I thought were going to happen did not happen. And a lot of things that I didn't thought didn't think were gonna happen happened. So <laughs> it was uh it was a really really intense year. But I'm happy with how it's ending. Let's have some like scratches as well. Improved a lot this year. Modeling, texturing, rendering, especially in ZBrush was my biggest focus. Yeah, I remember back when I was learning ZBrush. This was in 2012. That was the year that I was like, I'm really going to learn ZBrush. And uh, and I just started like working on it. Now, what do we do with this one? We have a netch loop. We, we kind of have a netch loop going almost all around the object. And we have the thickness, so we could use the thickness. Yeah, here, let me let me show you this trick, guys. This one's going to be fun. So I'm going to apply the subdivision, the dynamic subdivision to this guy. And as you can see, we have that blue thickness right there, which is important. Because that, that blue thickness allows us to have a, a single polygroup. If it's not complete, we can go to uh, see Muller again. And if we go to the side view or to the edge view, we can do a polygroup, poly loop. There we go. So I'm going to go to subtool. I'm going to duplicate that subtool. And then I'm going to select that edge loop. And I'm going to delete hidden. So we're only going to be left with that one. And then if we go to geometry, dynamic subdivision again, we can get rid of the smooth subdivision and just use this thickness option. To generate a little bit of thickness as you can see right there it's kind of like a like a border that's going around the whole thing and it's going both on the positive and negative direction which is really cool and add just a little bit more right around there that seems like this thing is not mirrored properly we're gonna have to solve that in just a second but once we have this i'm gonna hit apply and then i'm gonna go again to poly loop i'm gonna poly loop this like front line right here there we go and then with QMesh, we can QMesh Polygroup All. QMesh this up. And when we smooth, we're going to have a, a border around the whole mask. Not bad, right? Not freaking bad. What about that trick? Get a little bit of an issue right there, but we can just Dynamesh this and, uh, and, uh, and solve it, but that's... Uh, that's another way to add a, a little bit of complexity to the to the whole thing. And yeah, yeah, Gassi, I I uh, I started my own channel, and that that definitely that was the thing that I was not expecting. <laughs> um, about mentioning the the things that I was not expecting, that's definitely one of them. I'm gonna try using Inflate here. Let me just make sure that I have uh, symmetry turned on. There we go. So I'm gonna use symmetry. We're probably gonna have to to dynamesh this or something to to clean that i mean it doesn't look it looks interesting let's add another division so i can i, I think i can use that as a, as a sort of like loop so you know how leather sometimes like attaches to a specific point and we can do something similar on on this borders right here 
So this were like leather strips that were attached. And that extra level of detail also helps add a little bit more visual interest. It makes it look a little bit more realistic, right? Like it's made out of multiple, like small pieces. And again, all of that is going to be baked, so I'm not too worried about the, the detail. I started my own channel. Yeah, that, that was uh, that was a big one. <laughs> that was a big, big change. This guy seemed like, I don't know. I'm going to... I feel like one of them got like skewed. This one got skewed. So I'm going to go see modeler. Let's split this properly. I know this was the thing that um, Polygroup Island. Oh. I know this is what crashed Seaverse last time, so let's be careful here. Let's just um, quick save again. I'm gonna delete all of the lines that we don't need. So, a Polygroup. There we go. And then. Uh, what else do we do here? We delete. Delete. Island. Not delete all the polygons? That's weird. What made you start my own channel? Yeah, other than the love for art, um, I was... Uh, this is not the first time that I'm doing, like, streams and, and YouTube and stuff like that. I was working with a, another company, but unfortunately, we had some uh, creative differences on how we wanted to move forward with uh, with the whole, like, channel and things. And uh, I just wanted to do something um, on my own. Like, I have a little bit more control over my own stuff, even if that meant starting Uber. So... So that's why I did. I, I jumped and started my own channel. No, no bad feelings or anything, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got this little voice inside that says, hey, you gotta teach, man. You know you love to teach, so just teach. There we go. So the straps for the head, we would do, or I would probably do something very similar. And in this particular case, like this, like bolts right there, I think those are one of those things that's better to do with actual geometry. So, um, I, I'm not sure if we got an insert multi-mesh thing. I know we have our stitches, but let me let me see. Yeah, we got this like industrial part, this one, clothing, there we go. So we got this sort of like uh, snapping elements. So I'm gonna use this one, the eyelet. But I'm gonna do with symmetry. There we go, let's push this in. And again, that eventually is going to be baked down. And here's the cool thing. Like, we got those. Let's add a, another small one right there. And we can add more of this, guys, in other points. So, for instance, over here. We can add one. Over here. We can add another one. Of course, over here. Because this one's going to go to the, to the main strap. And all of these little details... This guys follows something that I've uh, mentioned quite a bit in my in my videos, which is uh, complexity out of simplicity, right? So if you grab a lot of simple things, a lot of simple objects, and you combine them together, you're going to be able to generate something that looks a little bit more complex, like this guy right here. And, uh, and that's going to make the whole thing look way, way more interesting. Yeah, yeah, I was with Nextit uh, for... I was doing premium courses for like three or four years, and YouTube for like two years. And um, and yeah, earlier this year we we decided to to part ways. Let me load my brush. Thankfully, we saved the brush. Otherwise, we would need to do the stitches again. And again, there we go. Mask stitch. And let's just. I'm just gonna finish these stitches right here, my friends, and then we'll jump into Blender. I'm gonna show you some uh, retopology things. And if you're not following and you want to help us get to today's goal, let me or let us let us see the follow right there. Okay, okay, yeah, I know, I know. Stitches, sorry. Okay, let's make sure that we're not using symmetry here. 
So even though this is a, a very interesting thing, even though the what's the word, even though the model is not symmetrical, the retopology can be symmetrical, which is very handy because we're not really changing the silhouette too much. Yes, there are a couple of like stitches that are going in slightly different directions and things like that, but it's not really like something that's overwhel overwhelmingly intense. So when you retopologize, you can definitely keep things the same. I'm gonna do some cross stitch right there. You can see that there's way way more curvature on this like lower part of the of the beak. Gotta be careful there. That looks cool. <laughs> That's just like crazy, crazy looping over there. And those are the details that uh, doesn't take too much time to to do. And as you can see, it uh, it really adds quite a bit to the to the final result. Do like an X right here. And we can still go over each stitch and um, and add more stuff if we need to. So we can, like, the fact that we're using insert brush doesn't mean that we can't sculpt anymore. If we need to, again, if we need to add something, it's relatively easy to add it. Okay, we've done a lot of crazy ones. Let's do some, some normal ones right here. I'm looking forward to oh yeah i was gonna mention this we will have a little bit of a christmas break so on the on the christmas week the amount of videos on youtube and the amount of uh, we're probably not gonna have a live stream i'm not sure i'm not sure yet maybe we'll have the live stream but there will be a little bit of a fewer videos on the youtube channel because um it's the it's, it's christmas right so yeah spend time with the family There's a lot of content on the channel. I think we got like over like 100 or almost 200 videos in shorts. So if you are new to the 3D world and you want to learn a little bit more, we're going to link the, the YouTube channel in just a second. There we go. Almost there, almost there. Yeah, it's funny because every day I get a question on the on the Discord channel. It's like, oh, Abe, you should cover this. And it's like, oh, it's already covered. Here's the video. <laughs> or, oh, Abe, you should try doing... Uh, I want to know how to do, I don't know, skin. We got videos for skin. Oh, I want to know how to do rigging. We got videos for rigging. Hand painted texture, sculpting, UVs. We got some projects like a chest. We got like a, a very cool chest project that you can follow along. And that one's cool to, to learn a little bit about... Uh, about UVs and modeling. So a little bit of everything, a little bit for everyone. For you to make a face, it will take you days, not hours. That's how it happens at first, man. Like that's probably the, the one thing that it's the most difficult for me to explain to students is like, you need to practice and you need to practice a lot, like a lot, a lot. I was, I was, um, I'm not sure I've shared this before, but, uh, you know how we all have hobbies, right? So I, I might be a professional 3D artist. I, I got over 10 years of experience doing this. So I, I know my stuff. I know how to do stuff in here, but there are other, other things in life that I'm learning about and that, uh, I'm practicing and I am not, I am a complete, complete noob in those areas, right? And um, and every single time or every single yeah every single time I try to learn a new skill or, or learn about a new like hobby or something, it's always the same thing. Like the masters and the pros on that part, they'll tell you you need to practice, you need to play a lot of games, or you need to do a lot of things. Um, I was thinking about chess. Um, I'm I'm a huge chess fan as well, and I've been playing for three years, and I'm still like a complete noob when it comes to to chess, right? Because grandmasters and international masters and all those guys, they've been playing for 
decades and they have thousands upon thousands of games so so it's um <laughs> that's how it goes that's how it is for for any skill on in the world like no one is born knowing everything and you need to practice you need to to learn to practice and and keep going okay so as promised let's take this into a uh, blender so that i can show you how i would approach a retopology process for a gaming asset like this one and um and the and yeah we'll, we'll do that now here though one of the things that i want to do is i want to mirror the stitches over here so let's do some cleanup i'm gonna delete that sphere there we go and then with mask lasso or select lasso I'm going to select all of the stitches, control W to make them their own stuff. And then I'm going to do a split, split hidden. So all of these guys are going to be the, the mirror defects or the, the clean ones. And this one, I'm just going to do a mirror and wealth. And there we go. So now we got stitches on both sides. We are missing like, uh, what's the word? We're missing things on this side, but it's fine. So yeah, um, let's let's take this to to Blender. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off the head. I'm just gonna leave the mask uh, on, and uh, we need to decimate this. I even though it's not super super heavy, it's a good idea to decimate this to to make sure that we get a good detail just for the retopology process. For the bake process, we can actually bake at way way higher poly counts, but for retopology decimation is is a good idea. So I'm gonna do a merge merge visible. And this is going to merge all of them into a single subtool. This would definitely be a single object at the end, like a, a watertight mesh. Like you don't need to, to decimate every single element as a, as a separate piece. And once we have this, let's try uh, decimation. So see plugin, decimation master, and let's pre-process. More gaming says, I have progressed on face sculpting. Now it looks so much better. It took me one week to get better at face sculpting. Still not the best at it. Oh, no. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it takes a long time. Yeah, I just saved uh, David. <laughs> we're fine. We're fine. Yeah, I, I think when I started learning anatomy, from my first character to my first good character, it took me like four or five months. And I was practicing pretty much daily. So it, it does take a, a little bit of time. Let's try going to 250k. Yeah, there we go. So 250k, as you can see, it's a really good amount of, uh, of uh, number right here. We do have a little bit of an issue here. Oh, you know why we have that issue? That's a, That was a mistake on my part. Let me delete this one go back so this one right here i forgot to apply the dynamic subdiv we need to apply this there we go so now again we merge visible now we have the proper the proper elements everywhere and now we can do c plugin i'm just gonna automatically go all the way to 250 so yeah when you're practicing and when you're learning any skill um i would say the first like 300 hours roughly are your your learning hours like the hours the hours that you're gonna need to understand what you're actually doing and then from hour 300 to hour 1000 is when you can start seeing some good results and then from 1000 hours to like 5000 you start getting really good and from 5000 to 10000 as the as the quote usually says 10000 hours of practice that's when you master the skill right and I've done the calculations. If you want to get to 10,000 hours, you need to work eight hours a day for like two and a half years or something like that. So that's another one of the things that I struggle with quite a bit with my students because because I, I understand them. Like everyone wants to be amazing at 3D very, very fast. And you're going to look, you're going to go online. You're going to go into, um, what's the word, into YouTube and go like fast sculpting ZBrush. And you want to be like the best sculptor in ZBrush in like two weeks. That's not going to happen, man. Like you, you need to go get over that and not try to get any like shortcuts or anything and just um, just start working and generating the hours. I'm trying every day, but I take breaks. Even I took a couple of times a day off because I was burned out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's completely normal. I, I made a short like a couple of days ago about burnout, which sucks. I've, I've gone through that several times. I recently went through a very bad streak of, uh, of burnout. So I completely, completely understand what you mean. Um, but still, even, even with burnout, it's going to take time. Like it, it, 3d, it's one of those things that it's going to take, take time to, to master. Now we're going to see if you guys were right about the size. I'm pretty sure there was a problem with the size. So let's take a look. Import mannequin. Yeah, <laughs> it was itty bitty 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 tiny. 
So super, super, super tiny. Let's start scaling this up. Wow, it's really, really tiny. Really? That, that, that small? Let's go Arch Extract, Scale. What the hell? Can't be that tiny. Where is it? Or is it really, really big? It's really weird. No, I don't think there was an export error, but let's try again. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to C plugin. And there's a plugin that we can use called the Scale Master. I'm going to do a short about this one soon. And I'm going to set the scene scale. So as you can see right now, this is measuring 175 times 26 times whatever. And I'm going to say that these are going to be like centimeters. I feel like centimeters is a good... Uh, um, like this one right here. So it's 26 centimeters, 21, 17. So that's going to be the, the scene. So now if we export, it should export at a, at a bigger size. Let's try again. Mask decimated. Save. Yes. Uh, export selected. Um, being, yeah, everything's good. Okay. File import X. The hell oh there you go okay it was it was way it was very small but it's also way high so i'm just gonna say object and set origin to center of mass volume there we go and let's uh move this uh, do zero or just the gz let's move this down there we go yeah that's way better i'm gonna make it just a little bit bigger perfect just press the dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know, I know. Uh, I, I actually don't have a, <laughs> I don't have a number pad on my on my keyboard. It's the the small form factor, so I, I don't have all of those shortcuts. Uh, more more gaming says, hey, I'm doing that every day. Challenge myself. It's so satisfying to see my products, even my unfinished sculpts. In like, wow, I made this. I made that. It's kind of fun doing 3D, but again, I'm practicing everything for realism. Yeah, and and um, as long as you enjoy the process, that's all that matters. I would say that's the most important thing because I've had friends that started their 3d journey and they were miserable they they hated doing 3d they were like i want to do this i want to do like an amazing sculpt but i'm i'm gonna um I'm, i don't want to go through the whole process and i was like hey if you want to do that then 3d might not be your thing <laughs> that's the forbidden keyword why <laughs> it's a very fun one i i got this because the space on my computer was getting very cluttered with um with the tablet and everything and this one lets me be a little bit more flexible but i do suffer a little bit from the from the shortcuts it does have all of the other shortcuts like the camera shortcuts but uh yeah so i'm gonna be using retopo flow which is a a very cool uh plugin that's available for free if it's non-commercial work so you guys can can get it it's it's a little bit pricey if you if you buy it for production it's like 80 dollars i think uh mask demo there we go uh but it's really really good it's, it's probably the most similar thing that we have to uh to maya squadra and i'm going to show you just a couple of sections where you might be seeing or that you might have uh questions about how to approach in the, in a retopology perspective and the, and then i'm going to jump into into substance and do a quick bake so let's do this one What Wycom do you use? I, I'm using a Huion uh, pen display tablet. It's a 16 inch um, pen display. It's uh, really, really good. I got a review video on the YouTube channel as well, if you want to see it. And it's uh, quite affordable. I, I think because it's the 2021 um, version. So I believe you, you can get it for fairly, fairly cheap. So big question, how will we handle this? Well, there's, there's two ways, but ideally you want to hit the high points of your element. So in this particular case, if I'm using, for instance, the poly pen, I'm, I'm going to draw polygons in this way okay so i'm gonna draw polygons to the apex to the to the highest point of the stitch and that will be my my main line right there okay like that so that will be the the first part like how do you catch all of those stitches on the baking process you would do something like this you would just try to to, to catch the, the high points of the elements because all of that information, all of the high points and everything, that's the, that, that thing is going to be uh, captured on the, um, what's the word? On the bake, right? And then you just keep going from here. That's pretty much it. 
Yeah, XP XP pen is 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 way cheaper. I I tried it, and the thing that I didn't like about the XP pen was the pen, the actual pen. Uh, it didn't feel right to me. So I I tried the the Huion on with another friend that had it, and and that's where I decided like, oh yeah, this one this one works a little bit better. Before this, I had a a Wacom Intuos Pro. It was pretty much the same size, but it, it had no screen. I, I don't use the screen too much. Like even right right now, like I was when I was sculpting, I was sculpting with my hand over here, and I was watching my screen, not the not the tablet. Um, so so yeah, but I did use it quite a bit when we were doing like the hand painted stuff. So you're, if you're doing illustration or a lot of hand painted, it might be a good idea to um, to use a pen screen. Okay, so here's the first like big like changing in silhouette that you need to take into account. When you get to this point, you will have triangles. It's very, very common to have triangles. And that's why I really like this tool, because you can very quickly draw the, the triangles. Because these triangles are the ones that are going to allow you to kind of like jump up and grab the profile of the next element that we have right there, like this. Okay. And you want to push this vertex as close as possible to like the 90 degree, not 90 degree, 90 degree is very dangerous, let's say, but you do want to push it. And for instance, here you can see that the curvature is not being captured properly. That means that we're going to have to have an extra triangle right there. This one's going to be up here and this one's going to be over there to capture the silhouette a little bit better. So those type of like arrangements where you have triangles to help you like solve the silhouette are going to be very, very important when you're doing it. However, and this is very important. You do want to try to keep in an, an organized effect. So for instance, as we get closer to this one in here, since this is a very thin layer, like that little layer right there, you don't need to consider it. I'm actually going to like, eventually I'm going to bevel this a little bit so that we can see it better on the, on the bake, but I'm not going to go up and down on that little element because the silhouette doesn't change that much on this one though, on the, on the high point right here, we do want to have that silhouette. Now this acid is, um, I'm going to say a, a little bit of an easier acid because it's not going to deform. Even though it's a face or a face mask, it's not going to deform. It's always going to look like a, like a solid object. So as long as you're capturing the, the main silhouette, like what I'm doing right here, that's going to be more than enough to um, to capture all of the details on your, on your bake. Again, ideally, you do want to have a nice edge flow. So for instance, here, as I keep going lower and lower into the or towards the jawline, I am trying to keep this in a in a clean sort of like a effect. Topology is one of those things that I see people worry a little bit too much about. Like uh, I've seen wars on Reddit and on YouTube and on like forums and Facebook. Like people are like literally fight to the death for like that's not proper topology. It doesn't matter. Like if it works, if it looks good on the render, if it looks good on the game, if you don't have any shading issues, if you don't have any displacement issues, having one extra triangle or two extra lines, it doesn't matter. Like people really choose fights that are, in my opinion, a little bit worthless sometimes. There are, of course, if the topology sucks, if the deformation sucks, if the if the rig breaks or whatever, then yeah, of course, at that point, it does matter. But there's so like like minimal things that I see people fight over in regards to the poly. Like someone will be like, oh no, you don't want this thing to flow this way. You want it to flow this way. It doesn't matter. It's an aesthetic object. It's not going to deform. It doesn't matter if it flows one way or if it flows the other way. Okay. The only thing you want is you want to have a good amount of polygons. You want to capture as much detail as you can with a low poly version. And you want to make sure that, um, that there's no issues on the on the topology flow. If you like manage to capture those elements, then you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be completely, completely fine. See that? So that right there, that's perfectly fine. This works nice. I'm nervous about recruiters thinking. I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you something that um that was shared with me when I was when I was uh finishing my school. Unfortunately, the first people that see your stuff online are not like the actual people that you're going to be working with. The people that you see your stuff online are usually people from human resources, from HR. And most of the time, they don't know what they're looking at. Like they, they really don't know about topology, about textile density. They have a, a good idea. Like they, they have a good eye to know 
Uh, not everyone, again, not everyone, but a lot of people that see your stuff, they're not going to be super, like, trained on the on the 3D stuff. That's why they tell you to always have very clean topology, because that's the thing that they'll, they're told to look for. They are told to make sure that there's not a lot of triangles, make sure that there's not a lot of angles, make sure that things are flowing nicely. And if they see that, you get, like, the like the first approval. But the people that are actually going to be seeing your work and that you're actually going to be working with, they're going to tell you the exact same thing that I'm telling you. Like, yeah, I mean, of course, you need to take care of topology. You need to, to be mindful of it, but don't stress too much about it as long as your asset is working. For instance, here, like we got this square that's kind of like two triangles. We got this triangle right there. Is that the end of my topology? Does that mean that I suck? No, it's fine because it's a very flat area. Very, very flat. And we can change, for instance, the, the flow right here. Here, I'm just trying to, to save myself a couple of polygons. So even though this might not be the most perfect one, it's going to work just fine. Okay. Just relax this a little bit, and that's it. So, so yeah, like not everyone that's gonna be seeing your your stuff online is gonna be is gonna have them like the most uh, information about, or is gonna have the most up to date information about. Uh, what's the worth about the topology and stuff and uh it, this happens in every industry like um, it's probably that you guys have seen uh what we call the armchair judges like people online and i get this all the time it's very very tiring to be honest but i get people online who are just 3d hobbyists right like people that do 3d but they don't do it professionally for like studios or for for big clients and uh, you show them like your work or whatever you show your work online and everyone's got an opinion they're gonna be like oh your texture density is wrong Dude, you don't know why I made the decisions that I did, right? Like, I'm, I'm not asking for, for suggestions. Your topology is wrong here. Dude, we had the rig working. It's working. The product is selling. Uh, it's it's it, it's very funny to me. Um, we have a product that, that we sell, uh, VR experiences. I've, I've mentioned this before. That's, like, our main focus. And it's always funny when we see feedback. It's like, oh, this looks horrible. No one's going to buy it. Dude, it's a very successful business. People are buying it. Just because you are not buying it doesn't mean that people are not going to buy it. So... Yeah, everyone's got a, a lot of uh, a lot of um, opinions online, unfortunately. So you need to to get a, a thick skin and not listen to everyone. I I always like to uh, talking about opinions. I always like to tell my students, listen, but then evaluate where that opinion is coming from. Like, is it a valid technical opinion? Like your shading is wrong, or the scene is too dark, I can't see anything, things like that. And then, of course, you need to listen. Or is it someone that's just giving your opinion? Oh, I don't like, uh, remember, Sarn, that we got the, um, <laughs> this was very funny. When we first released a course, the, the Blender Axe course, there was a dude on Facebook that, that was like, oh, that axe is so, it's such a bad design. No one would ever handle that. Like, it looks so horrible. Um, I can make something way better. And then we just stocked his, uh, his portfolio and it was just like uh, I, i'm not even gonna say how bad it was so everyone's got an opinion online you just gotta stick with what you know again hear the feedback that's valuable to you and just forget whatever it's not yeah 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 he did like a super low poly like shotgun or something it's like uh dude come on like if you're gonna if you're gonna like talk shit at least have something to back it up <laughs> My brother, um, he, he's a salesman, and he has the exact same opinion as me in regards to that. It's like he, he deals with a lot of other salesmen that talk shit about him, but he's a really, really good salesman. So he's like, if you're going to talk shit about me, my style, or my, my accomplishments, at least have something to back it up, right? Like if you are like a freaking amazing salesman, then yeah, I'll, I'll take you, and I'll accept your feedback, and I'll accept that I suck compared to you. But if you're no one, if you don't even know what you're talking about, it's just... Like, why? <laughs> that was Sarn. <laughs> that was Sarn. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we got this, guys. Uh, I'm just going to go out. So as you can see, hopefully with... Um with what you're seeing right here, you can understand what the main goal of the of the retopology process is, is to flow with the object, to flow in the in the right direction, and then get all of the nice silhouettes where the silhouette is changing. And now I'm going to show you how to... Um, how a bake would look. This is just a, a very, it's gonna be a very simple bake that we're gonna be doing. So I'm just gonna shade this smooth. As you can see, that's gonna be our shading. And we of course need to do a UV. So let's go to UV. UV editing, there we go. I'm just gonna do UV and I'm gonna do a, uh, where is the camera mapping? Project from view, there we go. UV unwrap and that's it. So that's my UV. So let's grab the mask again, file, export, 
FBX. Uh, let's call this max uh, decimated. Let's call this proper size. That's the selected object. There we go. Then we grab this one. File. Export. FBX. This one's going to be mask low demo. There we go. So let me do a quick save right there. And let's go to Substance Painter. It says, also, Abe, I'm soon going to have a job. A company wants me to like training process for me in Blender. And if I complete it, I will have a job. It's about 3D RQ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll wait until more gaming comes back because that's that's his question. But yeah, there's a lot of things out there that involves uh, or, or have to do with 3D. And you can you can do a lot of stuff there as well. Like, uh, again, you can learn a lot of things and, and make good money as well. There's, there's good money in advertisement, 3D printing, medical visualization. Like I've seen a lot of things. Jewelry. Uh, let's do mask low demo. Let's do 2K just to get some very nice detail and hit OK. So this is our low poly, of course, just a very, very basic version of our element. But you can see the, the ridges and the and the effects that we have right there. Now we're going to jump into the baker. Going to bake a 2K. And if we did this properly, the amount of red areas that we're going we're gonna to have is going to be very, very low. So you can see, oh, this moved. Oh, no, that's the cage. OK, so you can see that the cage on the cage, we're looking good. Maybe just a little bit of max frontal distance. There we go. And this should be catching everything very nicely. So let's bake. We're missing a couple of points, like internal points right there, but it's it's internal, so so we can hide that with uh, with some rust and grime. And look at that. So you see this in game. This is what you're going to be seeing in game. And it's very, very difficult for a player to be going like super, super close to the element and seeing every single like effect. And you can see all of the detail, the metal detail over here, all of the wrinkles from our letter, all of our stitches, the border here. Look at how we get that nice little line for ambient occlusion. That's that's all we need. And <laughs> that's all we would be uh, doing. There's, of course, ways. And uh, this is something that I'm going to be covering a little bit later on the, um, on the premium courses. But there's ways to mask specific parts of your of your element to make sure that you can quickly select uh, certain things like the like the stitches and things like that. It's loading. I think it's loading. Come on. Let me close some software because I think it's becoming a little bit heavy. There we go. So here, let's increase the tiling a little bit. There we go. And then, for instance, we can add like a like a dirt layer. And this is why the maps and the bakes are so important. Because thanks to the maps, we're going to be able to get into all of the crevices and things. Look at that. Right? That's what we're looking for. That's going to give us the depth. And, and with all of this depth and all of these values that we're creating. Yes, exactly, uh, Roma. We would be using ID maps. And with all of these values and things, that's how we would be getting all of the like the next details for, for this element. I'm going to add just one layer here. You guys are going to like this one. So this sort of like light beige color I'm gonna make this a, a linear dodge black mask a layer i'm gonna look for some scratches so yeah that's it this one we could even touch the height information push the scratches down and this is the the amazing thing about the gaming pipeline that's one of the things that I love about the gaming pipeline. It's the fact that once you get into texturing, you can generate some very, very cool details that will take a little bit longer to do in the in the sculpting section. But yeah, that's it. With this, we've uh, completed today's lessons, my friend. Hopefully you guys liked it. Um, today we went over the creation of, uh, of this mask right here. Or at least the the beginning parts of, of this mask. Again, I think I think it's worth it to, to do a second part. What do you think, Sarn? Should we do next week continue with this one? I think that that's going to be quite nice. And um, and yeah, that's pretty much it, my friends. What do you think? A good stream today? 
I think it was a very lovely stream, and we had a lot of uh, cool questions as well. Aki Senpai says, yes, yes, yeah, we definitely, I need to finish this prop Roma because we're going to be using it for, for the premium course, as I mentioned. So I am going to be working on it a little bit more on the next couple of days on my, on my off time, on my free time. And then next week we'll finish up whatever I need to finish. Okay. Maybe we'll do the texturing next week or something. So yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you very much for hanging out. Thank you very much for being part of this amazing community. If you want to join, we have our Discord channel available as well. We got uh, all of the resources there and uh, we got a lot of um what's the word we got a lot of um of tutorials in youtube we got our premium courses as well and uh yeah it's just uh i'm just happy to be here happy to be sharing this with you my friends thank you again for being here and i'll see you back on the next one Bye bye